Casey Johnson from CPA.com. Casey, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, Deneen. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Um, yes, Casey Johnson. I'm Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at CPA.com, which is the uh, business and technology arm of the AICPA. Well, I've been looking forward to our discussion today, Casey. Thank you for joining me. Obviously, I used to work at CPA.com uh, and was there for 12 years and obviously, and just learned so much. You joined CPA.com how many years ago? Well, I've worked with CPA.com for about three and a half years now, um, coming on full time just this past January. But share your background prior to joining CPA.com because you've got a great background. But yeah, yeah. I've been in accounting technology for about a dozen years now. I try not to age myself with the, the number, but uh, <laughs> yeah, about a dozen years. I was on the technology side, um, running a cloud computing company for many years, exited that in 2014 and started my own consulting company. So um, I worked for many years um, as an advisor to the tech companies that were trying to build solutions for the accounting and finance role. So whether they were approaching the accounting profession as a sell to or a sell through, I would help them to build strategies, understand market, ecosystem, um, identify potential integration partners, et cetera. Yeah, and I think that that experience has brought a lot to CPA.com as they've helped the profession evolve through the use of technology. Uh, and so I'd love for you to kind of share what you're working on now at CPA.com and, and some of the newer things that CPA.com has been focusing on as we help the profession evolve right now. It's such an important time with what's happened in the world over the last year. Absolutely. Well, right now, much of my time is dedicated to either the AICPA Town Hall, which is the, our most popular, you know, resource for members, as well as digital CPA, because it's just around the corner in December, um, coming back to in-person in Nashville this year for our 10-year anniversary. So we're very excited for that. But um, really, I live and breathe tech ecosystem. I'm trying to keep my pulse on what the emerging technologies are, how those could impact um, future practitioner skill sets, service lines, et cetera and then building out different thought leadership. I also um, am responsible for the Startup Accelerator, where we invest in multiple companies um, each year and put them through a six-month curriculum uh, to really kind of give them a deep dive into the accounting and finance world um, so they better serve our, our members. Um, so, yeah, very busy. <laughs> no lack of work and lots going on. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the digital conference because I can't believe it's the 10th one, Casey. I've been to all of them except for the first one because I was pregnant and my, my daughter was born in December. Um, originally, it was actually supposed to be in October, but then Sandy Storm hit DC and the whole area. And so they postponed it to, to December. So I've missed the first one, but I haven't missed um, and I will not miss this year either. I will be seeing you in Nashville in December. Um, but can you share, I mean, I looked at the agenda this morning. You've got a great lineup of speakers. Um, I see that you have a lot of AI built into the discussions, which obviously Blackkeeper is an AI company, so I'll be attending those. Uh, but can you, can you share what the theme this year of digital is and what you've really built this year for our folks that are attending? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Digital coming into the 10th year has definitely evolved. As you know, it's um, kind of it, first initial birthing was all focused around CAS. It was it was a CAS conference and it definitely has evolved with still that backbone being um, client advisory services. Uh, our theme this year is leading the way. And I think our advisory uh, board just hit it nail on the head with that theme this year. Because, um, you know, we're always looking at where are we really at right now? And the profession has not only led the way in the last 18, 20 months with the pandemic for their clients being those financial first responders, um, helping them when they really didn't know how to, you know, stay afloat. Um, 
But on top of it, the digital CPA community has really led the way for the profession, being the most progressive firms um, out there, the ones taking some risks and adopting technology uh, sooner than the majority does. So I think that, was, that, the, that the, was in the way really fits for not just the community, but the profession as a whole. I agree. That was something I read. It says rapid change facing the profession and that the innovative firms are the ones that are ahead of the curve. And I know that we don't really tend to think of firms as being innovative. Um, but there's so much talent at firms that are, and there's younger talent that are really embracing the change and embracing the technology. Uh, and so I, I love that it's digital. It, it has evolved. You're right. It was really a cast foundation, which is where I focused initially at CPA.com. Uh, and that, that's still the, the, that's why I love going so much because I don't think there really is any other conference that has that type of dedication for those leaders at firms that are trying to change accounting and advisory, um, but it has evolved. And I'd love for you to talk about, I was reading, you sent to me the great accelerant. So I'd like to talk about that. Uh, and there's so much good information in there, but my favorite thing is the hype cycle um, because you've evolved it. I think I first saw Eric Askerson present that about four years ago. Uh, and I still use it, so I want to snag the updated one. But can you kind of talk about how technology in the accounting space has evolved, and and what you're seeing now in that in the trends in the hype cycle? Yeah, so the hype cycle is really interesting. Um, this is one of our most popular kind of. We do reveal at Digital in Eric's keynote each year of the new year. So what it's based off of is Gartner, the research company. They publish each year like hundreds of these hype cycles, but they're all very specific to um, different industries or different types of technology. They do one just on blockchain and they plot just thousands of different emerging trends on these hype cycles. Well, none of them were really focused on the accounting and finance role. So a few years ago, um, we took that framework and the different maturity models that Gartner was showing for technologies that directly relate to accounting and finance. And we started creating um, our own version of that that plots 10 to 12 different emerging technologies. So it's not too overwhelming, but hey, these are the ones that we see as the biggest impact over the next year. So we are releasing it at digital um, the one that you see in this report is the 2021, so it gets released in December, but in reality, it's forward looking for, okay, over the next year, this is what are going to be the big trends. And essentially, uh, what it does is it shows in Gartner's um, five different kind of stages. So they have an innovation trigger, they have the trough, um, excuse me, the peak of inflated expectations is next, then it goes into the trough of disillusionment in the slope of enlightenment, and then finally kind of the plateau of productivity. So we plot the 10 to 12 different, um, and it's not just us, it's we get input from, you know, a dozen different thought leaders and, and top practitioners uh, leading the, their technology divisions um, to uh, make sure we all, we're all, it's funny, we're all very close, but maybe as you get input, one moves just a little right or left, um, but so we will release the 2022 version oh, good. at digital. So stay tuned for that one and I'll definitely share it for you. So you have the most recent version. Um, but yeah, for 2021, there was definitely a lot of AI on there. The most mature of the AI solutions that were plotted on that one was definitely RPA. So robotic process automation. Mm -hmm. That one's definitely the one that's most mature and it has, um, the most real use cases and practical application in firms today. Uh, I think we also have on there machine learning, which is about to go, or it was in 2021, one, uh, about to go into the trough of disillusionment. Um, we also have um, responsible AI and adaptive machine learning. So we really kind of look at different um, iterations of yep. a of a technology. Um, predictive and prescriptive analytics was also on there. Yeah. It was really interesting to see how far 
predictive analytics had come in the last yes. few years. Yes. It really evolved and matured and was, we've got some great solutions out there that are, are helping practitioners um, and really helps to build those CAS services. The, the prescriptive is not as far along though. I think that that is still more in theory of what it could um, do and not so much the, the practical yet. I read in that article, Javier Golden, um, who I know he's, he has an AI strategy and he's bringing a lot of the AI into his firm. Um, he said, I took notes here, that you need to shape, shift, and adapt. To, it's the key to survival, um, which I think is so important because, well, obviously I'm a bot keeper now, which is an AI um, company using, you know, bots and machine learning to automate the bookkeeping space, which I think is the future. And I think in the past firms have, they're interested, but they're leery. And I think what, you know, the trend that I'm reading and, and some of the things that CPA.com is publishing is you've, you've got to embrace it in order to survive. It's here, it's happening. You can't ignore it. Yes, it's in its infancy, but you can work with technology companies and an easy way to bring it into the firm and use it with your clients. And so don't be afraid of it. <laughs> have a strategy around AI, have an AI strategy, embrace it, get comfortable with it. And it's not replacing people. It's really using more tools to be able to evolve your services. So what, what, what's the feedback that you're hearing from firms about this type of technology in this space? Well, it's funny, you know, I think that people understand uh, that AI is the future and they are leaning in more to the messaging around automation because we already have such a, a, a war for talent. We've got a scalability issue. There's just more work than what we can all handle, right? So I think that um, they're leaning into it a little bit more, but some of um, the ideas and kind of theory around it are a little still intimidating and right. who has the time to invest to research right. it all. Now, one thing that I would say though, when we keep talking about innovation, a lot of people always equate innovation to technology. And I don't actually think they're one in the same. You can be innovative and it have nothing to do with technology. And a perfect example would be like Southwest Airlines. They are considered one of the most innovative companies um, around and when you go to board a plane it literally has the ABC one two three get in line like you're in kindergarten I mean there is nothing technologically savvy about that method but it was innovative so I think that firms while technology makes being innovative easier um, don't get scared and think that you have to right. like when you look at that hype cycle and you see 10 to 12 different technologies don't think you have to right adopt all of them all at once have a plan to evaluate and pick one or two that you are really going to put high priority for that year to help improve your processes and systems now of course always be learning because those are always going to change you've always got to be learning because the technology is going to change way faster than what we ever will be able to adapt um, so that's one thing. And then as far as firms, and I love that you brought up Javier and what he says. Javier was one of our Innovative Practitioner Award winners a few years ago. We absolutely love Javier. And he does lean in to the uncertain, yeah. which I, I, I adore. Um, but it was funny. You know, about 10 years ago, my friend Doug Sleater at a SleaterCon said, um, agility trumps ability. And he had this hashtag. And that was 10 years ago because he saw like the technology hockey stick of the rate that it was um, maturing. And I think that this past year and a half, it that proved itself true that those right. that are agile and that are designing for agility and embracing that uncertainty rather than and getting comfortable in it. Um, which I know is difficult, are the ones that were really thriving in the past year and a half and that saw, you know, those tremendous growth numbers that we're all reading about 30 to 50 percent growth last year. Right. Right. They're able to take advantage of, of, of the situation last year. I agree. I think as I, I've been traveling a lot, as you know, I'm obviously in a hotel room right now. And so I'm, I'm, I love being back 
and I think people are feeling more comfortable traveling. So I like being back, sitting in sessions, talking to everybody, listening to what's on their hearts and minds. And I think that, um, to your point, because a lot of firms are at capacity, there's a lot of concern about mental health uh, right now in the profession in a way that I've never seen before. You know, you've got the great resignation happening, which certainly is happening in this profession, like, like everywhere else. Um, the data that I'm seeing is 70% of the people leaving firms are not going to another firm. So they're leaving the profession overall, which is a concern. And and I I believe automation is the answer right now at a time. Actually, I was talking to Bill, uh, the, the chair of the AICPA, and he said that's the number one thing people are talking about right now is he's out talking to firms, is staffing. And I said, well, what is their strategy around that? Like, What are they doing about that? And his answer was panic. And I want to say, automate, automate. And there's no time better than now to really put that focus at the firm of how can you use technology more in order to give your people a lift or a break or to be able to just pause and think. Um, so are you finding that firms are more, I know they're busy and I know they're drowning, but are you finding that they're putting this as more of a priority than ever before right now? Well, I think that, you know, you, you named um, one solution. I think that there's a few solutions to the town problem. There's not it, definitely technology and building that capacity with automation is a big part of it. But like, I think we have to be realistic as to what it can do, especially with compliance work versus, you know, the more advisory work. Um, so that that's a delicate situation. Mm -hmm. The profession. We actually have one of our speakers at Digital CPA this year. He's from MIT. Um, he's talking about building the future of work, David Autor. And more what he's focused on is, and I think that this is where people get a little nervous about implementing technology. So that's why I think it's good to educate on the how, and it's not replacing, but it's augmenting. So he's more focused, and he has tremendous research on this, but um, I think people got a little sick of all the theory and the news saying like machines are taking over, you know, the bots are coming, the bots are coming. Yeah. And what he yeah. talks about now that we have gotten past that kind of peak of inflated expectations and things are actually showing their true value, what he shows is more how the humans and the robots will work together in the future and how to really okay. build. Um, the value and that goes a lot back to the skills and the training and what types of services you're offering um so so i think that that's going to be an important part of the ai conversation over the next year um as talent as you said it's a big problem right now um and people look for different solutions i think that they can't just rely on okay i'm going to implement this technology right. and it's going to solve all my oh. problems in reality Right. There's a lot of different things that firms, as well as the profession in general, are going to have to adapt to and work to to solve it. It's not just a one one solution. Answer. Right. Right. It's funny. I was talking to my daughter before I came here. She's she's eight, going on soon to be nine in December. Um, and she was saying, "Oh, I was telling all my friends at work that you work with bots, that you work with robots." <laughs> and I, she's trying to explain to her friends what I do, and I was trying to simplify it. I was like, "Let's give an example of our Roomba. Our Roomba is a bot, and I don't want a vacuum. I'm a full-time working mom to travel. I want a vacuum, so I can push a button, and this robot knows not to go downstairs and underneath the bed. And like, it's smart. It's learned. It kind of learned the layout of our townhouse." And so that's an example. Like I think everybody thinks it's like doot, 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 robots, and these machines do what you don't want to do. It, it it is taking over that mundane task that you don't want to do. So um, I think when they look at this AI technology within a new way and start putting strategies in place, you're right. It's not a push button like it is with the Roomba and get started here. Um, there is a lot that they have to embrace with how to shift the people and how to shift the process. And so there's a lot around it. Um, but at the end of the day, all the research that I've been reading is that, that it makes people happier, just like my yeah. Roomba makes me very happy. <laughs> I don't have well, a vacuum anymore. It, yeah. And by the way, I just, <laughs> I, I, I can't you know, get it. But I think that 
you're right. It does give people, once they embrace it, it's like a weight off their shoulders because those um, repetitive, especially the data entry, the transactional stuff, to also, that's a good first step, right? I'm not saying that's all that AI can do because there's so many things, the different um, iterations of AI are capable of doing even today, not even in the future. But I think that's a good first step. And then you can right. start, I personally, you know, you can even tell by the, the hype cycle, I personally really like then as a next step after that, the prescriptive analytics and looking at, yeah. because we want to be proactive with clients, firms do, um, and right. you, you want to get ahead of things for them and helping them to understand what their numbers are really telling them. That's why I think the natural progression past the RPA is then prescriptive because if you can, you know, you can, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't completely look to the future and tell them what's going to happen. But our data can tell us a lot right. from historical information about what is most likely going to happen and, and trends that it's seen. So I think that if I were to tell a firm, okay, that has done nothing with AI yet, um, what am I going to look at? First is going to be automation, that RPA, the automation of your transactional um, repetitive uh, data. And then next is definitely going to be prescriptive so that you can get more into that advisory role for your clients. Right, right. I talked to a, a firm, actually, I just had Jenny Glassmoyer from Kirking Barbario on the edge, uh, and she is using BotKeeper. And that was the thing that I really liked that struck me that she said is before doing the transactional work, right, doing the bookkeeping, it was all about just getting the books closed and giving the financial. You ended with handing over the financials. But you're so, she was, her and team was so busy doing the work that that was, they were just giving the report. Now, because she's automated a lot of it with Botkeeper, it's freed up her team to start with the financials instead of ending with the financials. So now she can quickly bring the financials into the, her clients and have a conversation to analyze the data and be able to talk about the trends that she's seeing. But also she said, listen, to have the time to be able to listen to what the client cared about and what... Um, the, the, the numbers meant to them and be able to kind of understand even how her clients are thinking about um, their issues and how the data, you know, can, can correlate to that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a mindset shift and that's, yeah, talk about that. I totally agree. And it's not just, to, again, it doesn't just go back to technology. You're not just pushing a button and saying, okay, I've deployed this benchmarking, um, dashboarding software that every month it's going to shoot my client a report that just shows them stuff and I've done my job. That's not advisory. You've, you've got to go further than that and talk with them, help them to understand it, explain it, and then get, because the prescriptive analytics aren't there yet, that's your job. You've got to then right. help to understand now what, what does this mean? What should we be doing? Right. I agree. And, and she said, like we've been saying is she loves her job even more now because she has time with the client to really do the work that's the most meaningful and of service of them and so i feel like and this is one thing that bill reed said is that the profession is going to go kicking and streaming to a place they love <laughs> they're going to love being because this work is exciting uh and so are you are you doing any sessions of digital digital around that kind of mindset shift Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we've worked with Pascal Finette for a few years now, and we, we're bringing him back, actually, because even though his keynote is only about 25 of his 75 minutes, he's so great at those experiential exercises. Um, so he's going to do kind of a roundtable as part of his. And our whole program with him this year is focused on mindset, because what we don't want to happen is, okay, the pandemic thrust upon all of these firms three things that really we've been advocating at digital as well as just as a company for the past 10 plus years. Moving to the cloud, they had to because they were all remote. You have to be able to access things now from home. Um, right. Enabling, you know, remote, whether it be workforces or clients, you don't need those geographic boundaries anymore. 
and then three, uh, you know, doing advisory services. So while the pandemic thrust us into all three of those, maybe they were on firms um, roadmaps. It just wasn't as high of a priority and it happened during a tax season. Um, what we don't want to happen is, okay, now everybody's feeling comfortable going back in, putting out the right. fires of tax season, et cetera. We don't want to go backwards. We don't want to go back to the way things used to be. And so we've got to have a mindset shift that embraces this new reality of, okay, we just created lifetime relationships with clients. We really did advise them, whether it was on PPP programs, whether it was on, okay, other business relief programs, or just shifting if they had to close temporarily, you know, um, and, and how they were dealing with expense management, et cetera. They got thrust into it. There's other ways that those types of services can extend far beyond the pandemic. And so that's where I think the mindset shift is definitely needed. That's great. Well, I want to shift gears because I'm watching the time. We've got four minutes left. And I did want you to take a second to talk about the CAS ben benchmark survey because I've been anxiously waiting for that second one to come out. And I just think it's so great that CPA.com is is watching you know the cast trends and has been able to give this data to everybody about how cast has progressed because no one else is tracking it the way cpa.com is and so i was really anxious and i know that it just uh released i think you're going to be doing a third um but what what findings can you share with folks that haven't haven't been able to, to get that information yet yeah, it's free for download on our website. Um, it's funny, we actually just had on Thursday's AICPA Town Hall, Jen Wilson, who we collaborate with on, as well as PCPS yeah. on the CAS Benchmark Survey. We also had Eleanor Wack, who I know you're familiar with. And when you were just talking about how firms get so happy once they deploy AI technologies, Eleanor spoke to it so perfectly on the Town Hall because she was good. talking about what they what they do for their cast practice and that in tax season they have a 40 hour work week you should have seen the comments blowing up of like what do you mean how is that even possible um so that that kind of speaks directly to your point but yes the yeah. i think we are the only and we're obviously heavily invested in cas that's a, that's kind of um where our roots are but i think it is the only survey that is completely focused on advisory services um, but it was interesting what it revealed. So I think it's about a 20% median um, net client fee growth rate is what we were seeing in this survey from the past um, year, or I guess it was two years because that was the last time we did the benchmark survey. 47% um, mm -hmm. profit margins uh, for the top firms, which I think that's about 15 to 17% higher than national average. And then 55% um, of those firms were seeing a revenue increase. So, you know, we're we're doubling down on CAS. We're actually um, we released at that town hall some information about our CAS 2.0 framework, and we'll be diving into that. And we have a webinar. I think it's November 17th, but obviously diving into it very deep at Digital as well. Um, yeah. And and that new CAS 2.0 framework, it really just kind of covers those uh four cornerstones which are of course firm strategy and the governance of it the technology of course is a big cornerstone for it the practice development and then we'll have um a center for excellence which really helps with you know professional development training etc well i'm ecstatic because that's kind of, that's my passion is around cast and it started all at cpa.com so i can't wait to learn more about the cast 2.0 that you're rolling out uh, and I appreciate your time. Is there any questions, Stella? We've got one minute left. No questions from the audience. Okay, great. Well, so I hope to see everybody at Digital. Uh, Casey, I'll definitely look forward to seeing you. We can have a celebratory drink at all of your hard work and success. Uh, and if anybody, do you want to send anybody to the, the place uh, at CPA.com's website where they can find some of the resources, the benchmark survey, um, CAS 2.0, I think we posted the Great Accelerant and then Digital Conference. Where should they go? Just CPA.com or is there a certain section there under CAS? Yeah, just go to CPA.com. It's a pretty easy website to navigate. Anything under the Research and Innovation arm, like these special reports, the Great Accelerant are under Research and Innovation. 
the CAS benchmark survey is under our education like professional services and um, I think it's actually even directed from the main website and the town hall is free to all members um, every other Thursday. So hope to see you there. Great. All right, thanks. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Denise. Bye.